So we will have 10 a.m. worship in person. It will be also broadcast via YouTube as usual, but uh, you will you'll be allowed to come here, worship in the sanctuary with us in person if you can at 10 a.m. in the month of April. So I want to give you a heads up. For this week, uh, as been announced, we will have Good Friday worship at 6.30 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. So please refer to the link that's on the announcements right now. And uh, please join us and honor our Lord of, of his death day, a uh, day of, his, of the cross. And we want to uh, remember him in our, in our precious worship. And also, I will send you a week, a daily uh, devotional this week uh, via email, uh, a, YouTube, a short video clip for each day's scripture. And you can go ahead and follow the scripture that's in your bulletin. We're going to follow the Luke scripture, Luke chapter 22, all the way to the Friday, uh, Good Passion, I'm sorry, the Good Friday worship. So if you can follow along the, the reading for this week as we go deeper and meditate on the love of Jesus Christ. Um, anything else do I need to mention? Um, yes, uh, so everything else, please refer your bulletin concerning the student worship and the children's worship. Speaking of children, I, want, I need to introduce somebody very important to Cornerstone. As uh, Brother Ed mentioned in his prayer, Pastor David Shin has finally arrived from Pittsburgh. Yay! <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's answered our prayers, and you get to see him in person. So he's with us right now. I'd like to ask Pastor David to come and say a few words. Please. Uh, hello. Um, so it's first time to say hello for everyone. Um, I'm sorry that because of the COVID-19, I cannot say in person, but uh, still, I mean, we can communicate through this like YouTube or Zoom, you know, whatever the ways we can do. Um, but anyhow, yeah, my name is uh, David Shin. Um, uh, like, um, my Korean name is Eun Chong. Um, so anyhow, I'm the like, uh, new pastor for like, children's ministry. Uh, I'll be, I'm so happy to um, serve like, uh, awesome kids from here because uh, uh, I have uh, watched a couple of the like, uh, um, Sunday school service like, through the online, through the like, teacher Paula and the like, other teachers' help. So yeah, I mean, I'm so excited, and which means also I'm excited and nervous at the same time. Every time, as you, uh, as you know that, like, new like, journey is uh, always at the same time excited and nervous. But uh, I really need a lot of the prayer of you all and also a lot of the supporters <laughs> through it. Um, so just to let me introduce myself really um, briefly, shortly, that, uh, yes, um, like, my Korean name is uh, Shin Eun Chong. Eun Chong means grace, and the Shin means God, so God's grace, which you probably can assume that I was growing up as a PK. Um, like, from my previous church, from the youth group, they were saying, is that PK means player killer. They like, okay, so, you know, <laughs> you can imagine it. Oh, well, but I don't know this. <laughs> yeah, or problem kids. But uh, yeah, as a passive kid, I, well, I probably a little problem kid. But anyhow, passive kid, I was growing up because my name showed that, Grace of God, or, or David, you know, like. Um, but uh, what I wanted to share is that, like, yes, I was a uh, grow up as a passive kid, but still, Pastor is like a new word to me because I'm new, newly ordained. Like, it was like two years ago around. So it's still, I feel like if someone called me Pastor David, I was like, okay, am I pastor? You know. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to say is that like before I'm become a pastor or before I'm a pastor, I'm a children of God too, right? And I'm a Christian. And so what I want to teach our students is that how we can live out as a Christian, like Christian faith. Uh, because we all children of God, and we all know that the Bible itself is not just a book, book of the history, or it's, it was not written like 2,000 years ago or something, but it is the, like, alive, it is active, and it helps out us to how to live as his children. That's what my prayer, that's what, like, I also need a lot of prayer from the parents and teachers and everyone, even the students, like young students still, like from kindergarten, they can pray. That's how I feel from my previous ministry too. So yes, I really need a lot of the prayers for that and support for this. Um, so yes, um, at the end, I want to share that like, yes, um, I had an interview a couple times and I met the um, Pastor Joseph and the Samonim and like all the teachers and leaderships. Uh, but what, 
but I felt that they were really, really good people. Like even through the Zoom, even through the interview, I could feel that I could know that. But I wanted to. What I want to share is that, like, not just a leadership from Cornerstone chose me, but not just I chose this church. But I believe that God chose us. God has a perfect timing for us that He sent me here, and I can meet you guys all and the, all the lovely, adorable students from here, and all the parents and teachers. So yes, this is uh, my request for prayer that uh, like um, yes, pray for me that uh, I can be humble as He's a servant first of all. And also, he gave us and this reason and the purpose to meet here. So, like, yes, let us uh, pray all together. And even though I'm a, like, like I said, newly ordained pastor, I'm still young, so probably I'm not perfect. I mean, everyone's not perfect. But anyhow, please understand me. And if you think, you know, like, you know, I'm just not perfect, please pray for me <laughs> first. So I'll be appreciative for everything. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see you in person soon after COVID-19. So thank you. We'll be praying for you, uh, Pastor Shin. He's uh, more handsome in person, by the way. And he's single. So if you know anybody, anybody <laughs> just pray for him, for his... Uh, ministry here at Cornerstone. Let's open the Word of God this morning from the book of Romans. We're continuing our journey of faith in this beautiful, most important book of the gospel. And we are in the series, Strong in the Gospel Together. I'll be reading from Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And if you could, uh, please follow along in your copy of the scripture as I read God's word on behalf of all of us. I'm uh, reading from the English Standard Version as usual, chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amen and amen. Blessed be the word of God. Um, I read a story about a gentleman who approached a barking dog. It was a rather small dog, but it was furious. You know the kind of dogs, when you get close, they, they're as if saying, you know, I'll bite you any chance I get, get to you. <laughs> it's that kind of fierce dog, angry dog. But this gentleman got curious. Something didn't seem right. So he got closer, and he, he resolved to get closer and catch the dog to see if everything was okay, but the dog thought differently. <laughs> he had a different plan. So it was more fierce and barked even, uh, barked even louder. But uh, this guy was swift, and he cut the dog, he hugged the dog, and he, um, he captured the dog so the dog could not resist and could not attack this man. What this man noticed was, on the paw of the dog was a big thorn, a thorn in the paw, and it was causing much pain on the dog. 
So swiftly, he grabbed the paw of the dog strong, with his strong hands and pulled out the, the speck, this thorn in the paw. And he let go of the dog. What happened next was a miracle. The dog that was fierce and was about to bark and bite the person, person's finger off, there was no more. Instead, there was this loving, cuddly puppy wagging its tail, so happy, so thankful, and so joyful. And this man realized an important fact. This dog is like me. This dog who was angry and was, was barking and was stressed out was me. In fact, it was all of us who have the thorn of sin deep in our hearts, in our lives. We are weary because of our sins. We are frustrated. We're angry. We not only hurt ourselves, but we hurt others who are around us. We're barking. We're, we're afraid. And we are attacking others. Unless the one person who can take the thorn away from us, Jesus Christ, comes, grabs us by his strong hands and pulls that sin out of our paws, we can never experience the peace, the joy that comes from forgiveness. A lot, of day, a lot of times the reason that we are not at peace, that we don't enjoy peace, is because sin in our lives. Sin causing others', others sin in our life, my life or my sin in others' lives. Everything is a result of sin. And we hurt ourselves and we hurt each other. Unless we experience the forgiveness that is only granted through Jesus Christ. Only then do we realize the sweetness of that peace and also experience what that grace of Jesus tastes like for the first time, unless Jesus removes that thorn, that sin in our lives. No, that is the message of Romans chapter 5. When reading the gospel in the book of Romans, and we saw last week that we have been justified, made righteous, through faith, saving faith, right? Last week, remember that? And uh, we committed our lives once again to Christ. That Would you give us that saving faith to continue to trust you in all circumstances, situations, and have, so we can experience the salvation? Well, this morning, we're going to talk about the effects of that salvation. And the one key word that we want to really highlight this morning is the word peace. Peace is a result of the salvation that God has given us through Jesus Christ. How is Christ, that Jesus Christ, source of our peace? Is the question I want to raise and answer this morning. How is Jesus Christ the source of our peace, true peace? We'll look at what peace means, in fact, and how Jesus is the peace of God. There are two lessons to be learned this morning. I want, I hope you to, I want you to remember those two. The first is this, in Christ, we have peace with God. Can you say it with me, wherever you are? In Christ, in Christ, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. That's what verse 1 says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, he's talking about chapter 4, Abraham's faith, uh, righteousness. He's talking about chapter 3. Since we have been justified through faith, we have, as a result, peace with God. And the direct method was through Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean that we have peace? The, you know, simple meaning of peace, the dictionary meaning of peace, elpida in, uh, in Greek, is agreement. It means harmony. Two parties are in agreement. Two nations, two bodies of, of group of people are in agreement. That's what peace is, right? They've agreed to something. They are in harmony. They can work with each other. And the scripture is saying is, as a result of our salvation, we have peace with whom? God. We have peace. We have agreement with God. We have harmony with God. How is that possible? In chapter 3 and 4, we saw, chapter 3 rather, we saw that we were enemies of God. God was angry. God's wrath was upon us. There was no unity. There was no agreement. Only punishment. 
We feared the great judge, God. We feared standing in his court someday because we were never the doers of the law of God. We were under, we were unfit, short of the glory of God, the standard, the law of God. No one was righteous. Not one person obeyed the law. What happened? Well, we read, we've been keeping, we've been reading that, uh, you know, there was a righteousness apart from the law, and that was the righteousness of Jesus. That was the saving faith. We have made our peace with God through Jesus Christ. Let's go back to chapter, uh, verse 2 again of chapter 5. Uh, through, I'm sorry, verse 1, rather. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the important concept that I want to dwell on on this morning. It was the cross of Christ, the demonstration of God's love that made our peace with God possible. Verse 8, let's go back down to verse 8. It says, But God shows his love, demonstrate his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ's cross was the demonstration of God's love. How were we reconciled with God? Through Jesus Christ. His demonstration of love was the proof that we, are, we have made our peace with God. This week, uh, you and I probably saw this news. I, I think you saw the news. It was all over <laughs> internet. There was a, uh, a councilman in Ohio. He's a, a Chinese-American councilman. I think he was age 69. And uh, he served in the army when he was younger, military for 20 years. And uh, through his life in the United States, he came as a teenager to the United States. And throughout his life in the States, he said he experienced many discrimination and, and racial you know, hurt because he's Asian. And said, no more, I cannot stand that anymore. I want to speak up. I want to say the truth and do the right thing. And this is what he said. You know, people used to talk to me and say, you don't look American enough. You don't look patriotic enough enough. So what this gentleman did in this uh, town hall meeting, Ohio, uh, he takes off his jacket. He says, I heard that I was not patriot enough. Takes off his jacket, he unties his tie, undoes the tie, and he unbuttons the shirt inside, and he lifts up the shirt, and he shows the people. Would you show us the picture, Pastor? Shows the people of his scar while he was serving in the military, and he asked the people, is this not patriot enough? He demonstrated how he served the country, how he served with his life, in fact. And you can almost feel the solemnness uh, in that, uh, in that um, in city hall that he was uh, to having his meeting. You know, in fact, that's what God did. God in, in history, 2,000 years ago, he opens up the book, history books. He opens up to the page and shows us this cross. Is this not love enough? You and I were enemies, but is my son's death on the cross historical fact and died for your sins? Is that not love enough? Demonstration enough that I love you and I have made things right for you, and there is peace with me, God says, and you, because of the cross. That's what verse 8 is saying. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us as a demonstration of God's love. That's why in Christ, we have peace with God. Amen. You can say amen to that, right? In fact, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, explains this fact. You know, he prophesied, Isaiah prophesied, but he was, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
and with his wounds we are healed. The reason, the source that we have this peace with God was that Jesus, he suffered for us. He let go of his peace with God in order that we might have peace with God. He was beaten. He was, he had, was wounded for our healing, for our peace with the Heavenly Father. In fact, isn't that why we are keeping this week holy week? To remind ourselves of God's demonstration of love, his love for us. Remembering that we have been made right and we have made our peace with God only through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, what does this mean for us? I think this is what it means. For most of us who have already received Jesus Christ and have received this peace of God, we need a reminder of our status with God. Because you and I are not at peace with God sometimes. Our hearts are afraid to go to God, especially when you and I commit the same sin over and over and over again. You come to church or on Sunday, maybe you confess to God, God, I am sorry for this sin of gossip, of lust in my heart, of addiction, of, of hatred. Maybe you confess that. But you realize the next Sunday as you come to church, as you come to worship, you realize, oh my God, I confess the same thing. I've come to the same thing again. And that's the time when Satan attacks you the most. Oh my God, how could you commit such a sin again? Don't you have any dignity? How could you tell God, sorry, again? Just forget it. You're not worth it. God is probably angry with you. God is probably, you know, going to bring punishment in your life. Maybe a car accident, or you might get sick because you commit the same sin over and over again. You can't be a son of God or daughter of God. That's when Satan attacks us. But our assurance, our peace with God is not based upon our performance. It never was based upon our righteousness before God. Let's go back to verse 8 of this chapter that we've been reading. But God shows his love in the first place for us in that when? Not when we were right with God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul, Holy Spirit, through Paul, is encouraging us to understand what this means to have peace with God, to be reconciled with God. It's not based upon our righteousness, even after we're saved. No, while we are still sinners, God sent his son to die for us. What does it mean that we get to have peace with God? It means that we have the boldness to come to God despite our sinfulness. No, because of our sinfulness, in fact, our recurring, continual sin, we still need to go to Jesus. Through Jesus Christ only do we have peace with God. I am reminded of the beautiful story, the parable of Jesus. Perhaps the most blessed and most beautiful story, parable of Jesus, is the return of the prodigal son. In fact, I was so blessed by it, I uh, bought a painting, uh, you know, Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Son in my new home last month. Of course, it's not the original one in, uh, is it in Netherlands, I think? You know, uh, it's like probably millions of dollars. It is a copy. But every time I see this picture, I'm reminded that I have peace with God. Remember the story? The young man, he betrayed his father. He took all the wealth of his father and he squandered it. He was a prodigal, you know, he wasted it in his lust, in his pleasure, and he was a no good son. But the one good thing about him is that at that time when he had no, he had, well, shame, it was so shameful, right? In fact, it was so shameful that he probably couldn't even face not, all, not this, you know, uh, just a little less his father, but the servants too. The servants were probably better than him, performance-wise. But deep in his heart, the son knew something. He knew and he trusted that God was good. That God's mercy was greater than anything. He is unfaithful, but God was always faithful. In his heart, he knew that God had peace 
about his son. And so look back at the picture. Look at the expression of the son and the father. The father with the full compassion and full love looking down, peering down upon his son with much love and mercy. While the second son, the younger son, his, his head is in the bosom of the father, loving father, knowing that he is safe with the father. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 says, And this young man rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father, his daddy, saw him and felt compassion. Perhaps this is what Rembrandt saw in this verse, and he drew it in his painting. Yes, it was not partial acceptance. It was total acceptance. Regardless of the continual sin, his wretchedness, God accepted, the Father accepted the Son, and our Father accepts us through Lord Jesus Christ. It's like this. You know, no matter how much you scribble and, and make a mess on the seashore, the ocean waves come and wash away all the scribbling, white clean, it is, uh, just clean, makes the surface clean. No matter how much you can draw on the sand, Every time this great, vast ocean, powerful waves and wind comes and washes the shores clean as if it never happened. The love of God is like the ocean. Jesus' love, demonstration on the cross, his love on the cross is like an ocean that filled the entire world, our lives, our past, present, and future, and washes our sins every time we confess. God, I have committed. Yes, I see that. I wash it away. God, I have committed this sin again. Yes, I see it. I wash it again with my son. Brothers and sisters, how shall we respond to this love? There could be many ways, but I want to suggest this one. I'm going to suggest a second one later, but this first one is this. Let's fall on Jesus. You and I have the tendency when we fall short of God's expectation, when we feel like we've fallen short, we've disappointed him, we tend to run away. We tend to say, forget it. I'm hopeless. God is probably angry with me too. No. This passage is saying, through Jesus Christ, God is satisfied with you. We have peace with God, not based upon our deeds, but through Jesus. Let's fall on Jesus. If we're going to fall, yes, we are going to fall. You and I are are fallible people. We fall. Let's fall toward Jesus. Let's fall on Jesus, trusting and having confidence that God is satisfied with Jesus, and therefore God is satisfied with us. Secondly, how is Christ the source of our peace? In Christ, we have peace with God. But secondly, it goes further. In Christ, we have peace in painful situations. Jesus is our peace. And what that means is that we have peace in painful situations because of Jesus Christ. We can have peace. Look at verse 3 of our passage. Chapter 5. I'll read. Not only that, not only this peace with God and this acceptance, not only that, verse 3, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Did we read correctly? Suffering? We can rejoice, really? not just be calm, not just be patient, but we can rejoice in suffering. How come? Let's read on. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. When you and I go through hardship, when there's pain in our lives, now we can experience endurance, patience that was never there before. And what does that lead to? Endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out and given to us. What does that mean? It means that, again, when we are in suffering and pain, we learn endurance. And through endurance, like a calloused you know, uh, hand, you work hard and you become callous. Your life, your character, your personality becomes shaped and molded and formed into the image of that of Jesus Christ. And that excites us. Well, this suffering is going to bring me into a different character. I'm not such a you know, humble, meek, and patient person, 
but because of the suffering, I am becoming more and more patient, more and more holy, more and more like Jesus Christ. And this should give you hope. That's the logic of Paul. In Christ, we, have, we can have the peace in painful situations because we can know. You and I can know that this pain leads to something. It's not meaningless. It's not uh, uh, evil, a uh, curse on us. But whoever is in Jesus Christ, we know, we believe that this leads to character change. In fact, sanctification to become more like Jesus Christ. And that's why we can even have, we, we be rejoicing in times of suffering and pain. Paul wants us to focus on the reward, the hope that we have as a result of this pain. You know, you and I have the tendency to focus on the pain when we're hurting, right? Something happens, you know, we get sick. Or financial, you know, bankruptcy, something really grave happens, and we're like, oh no, this happened, and oh, I'm in pain, what am I going to do? We, we're all panic, and we lose our cool, we lose our peace. That's what we do. But Paul is saying, no, let's not focus on the suffering itself. Let's focus on what results as, a, uh, what result as after the suffering. That's what Paul is saying. See the bigger picture, and you can have the peace. That's what Paul is trying to say. You know, last month, I believe, when we, uh, the earlier, the time when we moved into this church, I was preaching, I, you know, I preached three times on Sunday. I was preaching the first sermon, the second sermon, and, you know, I was kind of a little relieved after this message. But I had to move something, like a podium or something. And by accident, I, uh, you know, touched the surface, the wooden surface, and a splinter, this thorn, went into my skin, my hand, finger. And it felt like it was like this big. No, it wasn't. It was like <laughs> really tiny. It was, you know, microscopic, in fact. But you can feel it, you know, when you touch it. You can feel the sensation on your hand. It's hurting. It's going deeper. So, uh, you know, I tell my wife to, so she can have compassion on me and, you know, I feel better. But, you know, all my nerves, my, my thought was on this one little speck. And I had to preach soon. <laughs> So uh, I asked the brother, and uh, he used his credit card, you know, two of his credit cards to try to solve this problem, right? It's not that he used money, but he used two credit cards to wedge it out, <laughs> to squeeze the little, little thing, the devil, out from my skin. But he was unsuccessful. The time came, so I had to come and preach, and I thought, let's not focus on this. Let's focus on this. <laughs> let's focus on what God has to say. And a miracle happens. I focus on this word. I forget I had anything on my hand, in my finger, even though it was still there. Later, I go back home. I use a small tweezer and precisely get it out, like less than a second, and problem solved. There's no pain whatsoever. I realized when you're focused on something, your pain goes away. You can endure, in fact. That's what Paul is trying to say this morning to us. When we focus on the pain the suffering, the, the prayer request, that, that dear thing in your life. If we focus just on that, we lose the bigger perspective. And what do we lose? Not only do we lose perspective, we lose the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. We are afraid. We are afraid of surrounding. We are afraid of people. We come afraid of money. We come afraid of ourselves. Paul is saying, no, we can rejoice in suffering because we know that God is still good and God takes care of, care of us. Let's see the bigger picture, the big picture, the plan that he has for you through this suffering. And that's in verse 10 of our passage of scripture. Go back to the scripture, verse 10, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. This is the condition, right? You know, we were made, we made our peace with God when we were sinners because of Jesus Christ. Much more now that we are believers now, we are God's sons and daughters of God, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by Jesus' resurrection. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. He's using this analogy. How much more? When we, when he, if he loved us when we were still sinners and saved us, 
How much more now, now that we are sons and daughters of God? It's like, you know, uh, if somebody's adopted and they're young, three, four years old, and they're really appreciative of their parents, the, the adopted parents, you know? Oh, thank you for saving me from this orphanage, this homelessness, parentlessness, and they're forever grateful. But after they're adopted, how much more could they be assured that these parents will take, surely take care of me because now I bear their last name. I am their son, their daughter. How much more? God is saying, Paul is saying, how much more would God take care of you? Could you not trust that God is good even in your suffering? It'll lead to a better character. He's interested in molding you to be like your, his son, Jesus Christ. And we can be assured that it'll be okay. And that assurance is peace. Our peace with God leads to our peace in painful situations. I'm reminded of Moses, right? Moses had a harsh life. He had a painful life, in fact. He grew up in Egypt under the enemy. Think about that. As a prince of the Egyptians. But he, his, his heart was always, always quick to act. You know, he was hot-tempered. And we saw his, one of his countrymen being discriminated. He couldn't just stand there. He had to do something about it, and he pushed this Egyptian and killed him. He became a murderer. What did he do? Even though he was a prince of Egypt, he was cast out. He ran away into the wilderness for 40 years where he met God at the, at the burning bush. And at the bush, in his encounter with God, he found purpose in his life. It was purely the grace of God. God met him there and called him for a purpose, for a mission. And for the first time, Moses realized that his life meant something. He couldn't do anything before. He tried, but he failed. But now he had peace with God. He had purpose for his life. He goes back to Egypt, right? He brings, back, brings out two million of his people with God. Now, what changed? He knew that God was with him. He had confidence about himself because of God. And was it a happy ending after that? No, for 40 more years. He had to suffer. He had this, all these thorns in his life attacking him. His own countrymen saying, go back to, let's go back to Egypt. I hate this dreadful wilderness. No, no food, you know, no vegetables, no meat. They were always grudging and complaining. And uh, there, was always, there was always this uh, um, hint of rebellion. All these thorns in his life. What changed, though? about Moses. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible reviews Moses' life, and this is what it says. Now the man Moses was very meek, meaning humble, meaning quiet, gentle, more than all people who are on the face of the earth. Wow. What a statement the Bible can say about this character. Moses was not such a person. He was not. He was haughty. He was hot-headed. He was just hot-tempered. He got easily angry, disappointed easily. But this man, Moses, was meek. His meekness was the greatest on all the earth. See, God was molding Moses to the image of the Son, Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what Moses recognized he says later in Deuteronomy, as he was about to leave this earth and let the people go into the land of Canaan, he prophesied, there will be another prophet like me, and you shall obey him. He was referring to Jesus Christ. See, Moses was totally at peace. Well, not totally, but mostly at peace, even in this wilderness, in painful, suffering situations, because he knew that God was leading him and it was going to be okay. He was able to be meek. And he's encouraging us. Moses is preaching to us, even this morning, through the book of Deuteronomy. Let us seek to be, follow that ultimate prophet, Jesus Christ. Follow his character, his meekness, even in our suffering. 
Because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character brings us hope, a greater purpose that God has for us. And knowing God is good all the time, we can have peace in suffering. Amen. As a response to this message, as a response to this week, I want us to you know, challenge ourselves to do something. First, let's fall on Jesus. If there's sin in your life, let's not run away from Jesus, but let's fall on Jesus. But secondly, let's most of all worship Jesus this week. That could be a foreign concept to some of you who are worshiping of your son's love 